All right. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. I saw in the chat we have people from all over the world. We're super excited to have you. My name is Michael Scognamilio. I'm part of our ASIC Outbound Product Management Team. I want to welcome everybody to another one of our live events, this one entitled Hardware Asset Management, End-to-End -End Visibility into Your Asset Estate. If this is your first live event, welcome. Check out the schedule here with that QR code with the dinosaur for upcoming live at ServiceNow events. We'll have a number of hour-long webinars to help you deploy, adopt, and achieve value faster across all of our IT asset management products. But first, a few announcements. Some of the information we present today is privileged and confidential, so please just bear that in mind. In addition, our safe harbor notice here, some of the information we're showing today is forward-looking in nature. Um, and again, please keep that in mind that it is subject to change. All right, with those out of the way, a big warm welcome to everybody. These, this is one of our commitments to you, our customers, to deliver relevant content to you wherever you are in our journey. Um, today, the goal is to have a better understanding of hardware asset visibility for HAM. So today's hosts, as I said, I'm Michael Scrinumilio. I'm an outbound product manager on the IT asset management team. And my colleague, Abi Roy, is helping out as well. Um, again, an outbound product manager on the same team. Our guest of honor today is Michael Smith, a principal product manager on the hardware asset management team. Um, Michael, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. The topics for today's session, again, are hand challenges for our customers, end-to-end -end visibility, and uh, life cycle. Throughout the conversation, we will also be having a demo today as well. Uh, throughout the conversation, we hope to keep this conversation with you guys as well. Please feel free to submit things in the chat, but more importantly, use the Q&A form um, for any, any related questions that you might have. Stay, let's keep the topics of, let's keep to the topics of today. Make sure you uh, share time with others uh, and, and try and keep your questions uh, really tight and well explained so that we can get, we can answer them in one fell swoop. Contribute what you know in the chat, of course, and we, um, we implore you at the end to please fill out a post event survey. Your feedback is vital to help making these events better and stronger. And we, we've really used them in the past to, to boost these. All right. Okay. So without further ado, let's jump right into it. Um, Michael, I want to talk about some challenges with hardware asset management. Based on your conversations with customers, your knowledge of the industry, why are customers um, even going down the path of hardware asset management? Sure, sure. And, and to be clear, when we're talking about hardware asset management, we're referring to the service now product of hardware asset management. Um, that sits on top of our base IT asset management tool that comes with the ITSM licenses. So I just want to bring that clear because normally when I'm brought into the conversation, customers have adopted a data model, they're tracking assets, but a lot of it's manual. And that's a lot of where the struggle is, right? And you find at that stage of the life cycle, customers are struggling more with data management than they are with actual asset management. Um, so when they're when they're spending their time focusing on the asset data, without a lot of automation, they often don't know what they have in their environment. So they don't have a lot of visibility. It doesn't allow them to do a lot of planning. And in all the other parts of the platform that can thrive with a healthy asset management um, profile is struggle, like SAC ops, uh, incident and change management. So lots of different parts of the group can, can struggle if, if asset management isn't done correctly. And if, if you lose confidence in the data, um, it, it really, it, it's a domino effect throughout the entire IT organization. So, and these, and, and these bullets here, I mean, that this is builds off of the, um, the ITAM review. Um, and, and just so we, how we focus with, with, with ITAM and the problems that we try to solve with HAM is giving you that control of your asset. So now you have control of your spend. You can start showing an ROI you have these numbers to actually stand up and, and look at where your spend is to improve your supply chain. But that visibility is critical. That's where it starts. Not just having the entire estate visible, but having a clean picture of the data that's within that state that allows the support teams, the compliance teams to be more efficient and to, and, and to do a better job managing the assets throughout the life cycle. 
um, and, and really understanding what you're managing, right? What's the scope of your hardware asset management tool? Obviously, we recommend having all the assets available and, and to be managed within the tool, but knowing what's online and what's not and being able to have that same level of confidence in your asset data when your device is on the network versus when it's on the shelf. Absolutely. So, and, and each of these five issues comes up probably time and time again with customers. Um, and so it's great yeah. to see them all in one place here. Yeah. So on, on the next slide, I want to click in a little bit further to visibility, right? Because it seems like visibility is the kind of empowering part of hardware asset management for the practitioner. Um, visibility, like you said, the domino effect and just, um, so maybe you can touch a little bit further on the visibility here and double click into that. Sure, sure. And, and in most organizations, when they reach that first level of ITAM maturity, when they've got a handle on the assets coming into the environment, right, we're collecting the asset data as we're receiving the assets. Um, and then we're also doing a good job as the assets are leaving the organization. These are usually the two focal points when starting a hand program is how we're managing assets when they come in the door and how when they go out the door. Where a lot of groups struggle is when other people that aren't on the ITAM team get their hands on the assets. Um, they could be out there doing break fix or change management or deployment. And if you're not doing those updates to the asset records, then a lot of systems are very manual and you have to swivel chair into another system to make those updates. And you're relying on other people as different life cycle events happen outside of the purview of the ITAM team. This is where your visibility can get lost. If I'm doing a break fix and I don't update that I did it, because and to be fair, my job in the data center is to make sure the lights stay on, to make sure business business goes on. It's not necessarily to update, make sure I'm crossing all my uh, T's and dotting all my I's. And that's where asset visibility gets lost in most cases. And then we have to go out and do audits that are very expensive and and really look at our data and, and make all those updates. That. That's definitely a big blind spot for the ITAM team. Yeah, and the one thing that stands out to me from my past uh, on this side is M&A activity and just the idea of two companies coming together and the two asset states merging and, and the need for visibility. Um, otherwise, you know, it, 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 a, lot of, a lot of issues can come up, especially for global organizations. Absolutely, and to, com and to you know, uh, make that more even complicated, with people now working from home and assets being more spread out than they've ever been. Um, you know, it, it, there's a lot more challenges today than there were even a decade ago. Wow. All right. So obviously we can see that change, it makes visibility challenging. So, and that's really where um, ServiceNow hardware asset management product comes into play. Um, so let's double click into that even further. Um, maybe, can you walk us through um, again how, how how we uh, how how asset management helps with visibility technically in the product? Sure, absolutely. Um, so you know we have a lot of entry points for assets into the organizations. If you're a recent customer that just started this journey, um, you're going to be working with legacy tools. Maybe you have a siloed infrastructure. One of the things that we always recommend is to start with some form of ITAM governance, right? to bring these, these different groups together so they have a stake in, into the ITAM um, platform and, and collecting all this data. So you could have, you know, your data um, for servers could be in a DCIM tool. Your network gear could be tracked in SolarWinds and your end user compute could be tracked in SCCM or a legacy um, ITAM tool. And we also offer our discovery and we have procurement, or, um, procurement data coming in um, so there's lots of different ways the asset repository gets seeded. Um, and then once it's up and running, we have integrations, we have service graph connectors with several asset intelligence tools, whether it's a tool like SCCM or JAM for Tanium, um, and, or it could be spreadsheets or advanced shipping notices from vendors or third-party companies that manage your inventory. To say the least, you've got a lot of people and a lot of data sources funneling into the, um, the repository. And if not managed properly, it can get out of hand. Um, it can get messy very quickly. So one of the problems, or one of the solutions that that Ham will offer, our hardware asset management product will offer, is is we have a content service that we have a team of of engineers that just do nothing but um, create and curate this content service of well over two million models today. 
Um, so as this data comes in, no matter how it comes in, whether there's spelling errors because it was hand jammed in, whether discovery isn't pulling things in properly, we're able to run that against the content service. And so you get a clean output of data into your data into your repository. So now you can report against clean, normalized manufacturer names, model numbers, part numbers. And then there's some additional intelligence that you're going to get, some UN USPC data. So you've got that device type. And if you're using a procurement system, there's some back-ended numbering there that, 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 that works with that as well. Um, and you get some lifecycle dates. So you'll know when that became general available, when you started buying it. When does it go end of sale? So you can start planning on what your next standard you, you need to buy. If I know that I can't buy these anymore after March, I need to line something else up. When is it no longer supported? So now I can start managing the health of my products and, and my platform to make sure that, that my end users have the latest and greatest equipment that, that can be supported. And all this is going to strengthen that entire life cycle. Like I said, you know, you've got the circle over here, you've got the acquire, that's normally where asset data gets created um, on, on a go forward process. But then we have the ability now to audit that data to ensure that what's in there is correct, to keep that data um, clean so it doesn't erode as we're receiving equipment, as we're maintaining and as we're disposing of it. Um, you know, we're able to now introduce a bunch of different workflows that we'll be discussing a little bit further to help automate that those end-to-end -end processes within the asset lifecycle. And then we have um, one of the cool things about ITAM. Um, ITAM and ITAM um, really, you know, blanket the entire platform of ServiceNow. So there's very few products within ServiceNow that will uh, not benefit from an improved um, ITAM program. So, you know, we've got with ITAM, it, you, know, uh, you know, you look at it like a weightlifter with two legs, right? You know, ITAM is the left leg, ITAM is the right leg. And by exercising the legs, they're going to get stronger together. Um, and you can't exercise just one. So that's a that's a really a, a great relationship the two have. So a cleaner CMDB will give you a cleaner uh, IT asset management database and vice versa. Um, and you'll be able to start doing stuff from a financial standpoint with ITBM, being able to uh, look at your you know, your technology portfolio and seeing when things need to be replaced to allow you to better forecast, upgrade and refresh activities. And then incident change management benefit big time because now my incident managers can work break fix tickets right out of the incident. And all they have to do is close the incident and all the asset updates can happen in the background. So you're not going into the service desk every couple of weeks and saying, guys, you're not updating these assets. You're deploying assets and not assigning them to users. You're not changing locations. You're not updating statuses. All they have to do is close the tasks and that, that gets done in the background. And then obviously SecOps and HR benefit from better asset data as well. Awesome, Mike. And thanks so much for walking through that. I love the better together stories and I can always count on you for inventive, um, you know, metaphors, love the weightlifter one and we'll be using that moving forward. So obviously from the last slide, right? We saw how important normalization is. Um, and I'd love for you to click in for our, for our customers here a little bit more on the content service process. Sure, sure. And one thing to make clear, um, we see questions pop up in chat quite a bit around this. Um, please be sure to use our Q&A feature too, if you guys have any questions. Um, but one thing that we do is we have, we introduce additional tables of normalized content that, that report up to your model record. So we're not going to change or update any of the fields. So you have a company table today, and I'm gonna use company as an example. Inside the company table, all your manufacturers and vendors sit. And there's lots of other parts of the platform that use this data. So we're not gonna overwrite it. We're not gonna do anything and change any of the records in the data, but you may have 40 different versions of Apple in the company table because discovery is writing to that. Procurement might be writing to that. People might be going in and creating vendors or, or companies on their own. So when it comes to the asset record, you're going to see a normalized manufacturer. And no matter what it says in the company table, you're going to have a normalized um, uh, information on the asset and model record. So that's where the content data shines. And that's where the, the service lives. Now, every week, you're going to get an update. So you're going to get a payload of newly created content, updated content. A lot of times, manufacturers will put out a laptop and they might not know when end of support's going to be. They might not know when end of sale, end of sales when they run out, right? 
So a lot of times these dates might not get populated for two years after they go general availability. So we're constantly going, we're working with our major vendors to update these records. We have direct links with them. We have trusted sources that we use to build this data, but you're gonna have data that's unrecognized, whether it's coming from a procurement tool, whether it's coming from a, um, a uh, you know, discovery or a service craft connection. So we're gonna have information that may not be normalized and that will anonymously get sent back to our content team and that's what they they use as the base of their their research, right? They look at all of our customers' anonymous data, and uh, and and they build the content library against that. So you may have bought a new model that we've never seen before, and that's how the the content mappings get made. So what we do, to be clear, we look at the map the manufacturer, which lives in the company table. We look at the product model and the model number, which lives in the CMDB model table. And we, we look at those three things to give you a normalized manufacturer part number and model name. Um, and that, that goes into the model record. Awesome. I think this slide, this slide uh, is another visualization of what you just spoke about. Um, any, anything you want to add here? Yeah. And, and so just to be clear, so we're looking at the manufacturer table, which, which is a... Um, which is in the company table. But once again, we don't write, we don't update, we don't do any um, data changes to the company table, but we use that company table. You know, there's there's a checkbox on there, is it a manufacturer, is it a vendor? So every, every model has a representation of a company and a model information. And so no matter how Apple is represented on the company table, it gets uh, it gets it gets normalized and it displays in the in the product. When you look at the the model information in the product now, there's a normalization window, and then there's an additional tab that shows all the lifecycle dates. So no matter how it came in through discovery, because discovery may have picked it up differently than the procurement tool or the person that hand entered it. Um, and you can see here this example up here. We've got three different MacBooks that have three different versions. So. And, and, and keep in mind, and, and so, you know, something that's often reminded is, is are we normalizing the, 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 the CMDB? So every CI, if it has a relationship to an asset, and most do, right? Most configuration items also have a link to an asset record. And you can flip back and forth between the configuration record and the asset record. Um, it's very important from a CI perspective that we don't touch and we don't update any of the major fields, the display value will be updated from the, the asset model. The, the display name will show on the CI record because there's that header of shared information, right? What is it, you know, serial number, that kind of thing. So as we improve our asset data, we're also improving our CI data as well. I hope that makes sense. Okay, fantastic. Yep. I, I try watching. not to go too far into the weeds with, with the normalization, but uh, we definitely can, that's for sure. Yeah, it sounds like, and I think, and I see a yes in the chat, it looks like our customers are, are responding well. I think, um, you know, to use one of your kind of analogies here, uh, or inspired by one of your analogies, you can't throw a party without cleaning your house first. And it sounds like here, um, a lot of ways to clean house before, I think we advance to the next slide here, we get to the party, which is some of the workflows that we want to talk about today. Absolutely. So, and that's what really distinguishes, like you mentioned earlier, the hardware asset management product versus the base asset management that's included in ITSM. Would that be correct here? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. This is where a lot of that automation that I was referring to earlier comes in. Awesome. So, yeah, let's jump right into it. I think, can you walk us through what we're seeing here and and, uh, and then workflows as a concept? Sure. Sure. So what we've tried to do with our, with our hand product, right, is is... If you're using just the base ITSM asset management today, you've got the data model, right? You can create models um, or you can have models created from discovery. Um, you can create assets and stock rooms and so on and so forth. Um, what we've built with HAM to help you automate that life cycle is at each stage of the asset life cycle. So we can start at request the need for an asset. We've introduced a standard hardware request workflow that is scalable, that can be um, 
selected for anything that you publish to the hardware catalog. So whether it's a laptop or a server, you could leverage this end-to-end -end workflow. And that includes things like sourcing, you know, um, can I pull it from inventory or do I need to transfer from another stock room or do I need to purchase it from a vendor? That whole process, that whole fulfillment process comes into play. Um, and then, uh, and so we've, we've built that, that request and fulfillment process into several of our workflows, whether it's a refresh um, or uh, um, a, a new asset or a loaner, we have to decide where we're going to get that asset from. And, and so with, if you're not using these workflows, you're going in and you're going to be manually updating these records as you receive them, as you deploy them, you're going to have to go in and put the assigned to where with our workflows, we can take whoever was in the requested for and assign it to that person. And that location um, all gets updated in the background. The lifecycle status gets updated in the background. Um, as you're doing inventory, um, we have workflows once again, we have an audit process that allows you to audit stock rooms. We allow you to create stock rules that will automatically replenish your inventory if you hit below certain thresholds. We have the ability to do transfer orders that'll update the assets as, as they go through. Um, and then we also have some functionality um, in the inventory space um, to, to help you, you know, look at, you know, where um, you know, where assets are in the, in the request stage. So, you know, what, what stock room that they're in. Um, we have a deployment task. So as, and, and this is where we get into, you know, and, and, and our friend from Scotland asks, you know, where the, the assets could be updated in the incident. So not just from a deployment standpoint, but when we're in a, um, an incident, if I've got a, a laptop that has a, a, a cracked screen, and I decide I need to do a break fix, right? Now that I have my inventory, my visibility, I can see what assets are in inventory and I can select an asset from my inventory and I can select the swap feature that will do a, do a break fix. So now when that technician closes that incident, it'll take the asset that has the broken screen, it'll wipe out the assignment, it'll wipe out the location, it'll disassociate any software deployed to it any software entitlements that you may have entitled. If you have it attached to any contracts, it'll break those contracts and it'll put that asset back into in stock, but it'll be pending disposal because it's broken, right? Or pending repair, um, excuse me. And now we have the new asset that you selected from the stock room will now be assigned to this end user. The location data will be updated based on the end user's information. Any software entitlements that were on the first one will move to the new device any contracts associated, maybe there's support contracts um, that you need to associate will get moved to this new asset. And all that stuff happens as the technician closes the incident, puts in the resolution. Um, and that saves, you know, five to 10 minutes on every incident for every break fix. And think about how many break fixes you do over the course of a year. Um, it'll, it'll save you a lot of time and, and money and, and optimize your entire service delivery process. And your end users will appreciate it because they're gonna get their tickets resolve faster because the technicians are now resolving incidents. They're not doing asset updates. Um, and then the, the whole retirement process, right? Of having a, a disposal request that you can associate all, you know, you may have a pallet of a thousand, you know, a couple pallets with a thousand assets that need to go out the door to a disposal company. But from a compliance standpoint, you need to be able to show all of those assets where they, they were disposed. Who picked them up? What date they were picked up? Is there a certificate of disposal that if I get audited, I can say this company picked them up? Now you have a request and an end-to-end -end workflow that covers every stage of the, the process to get those assets out the door that's auditable, that, that is now part of your asset history as assets are retired. And as assets move through the process, as they go from in-stock pending to disposal to in-transit to the disposal vendor, to when the disposal vendor confirms that they've got them and they've disposed them to retire and dispose. You know, if you're doing a thousand assets as part of a, um, a disposal activity, that's a thousand updates you don't have to worry about. They're all gonna get that as the workflow gets executed. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, so um, why don't you introduce us to one of these kind of common scenarios here with our person like Casey. Sure, sure, so, so Casey here. Um, and this, this is a anonymously repurposed scenario that one of our customers, uh, and in fact, a few of our customers have brought to us. So this is from real life issues that we find. 
Um, you know, Casey is, it, we work a lot with hospitals, right? And hospitals tend to be campuses. So you have multiple buildings, multiple locations within one location itself, right? Um, and, and if you're an asset manager on a campus, it's very challenging as assets are moving around, right? Um, and especially with hospitals, they have to maintain their HIPAA compliance. But there's compliance rules for all sorts of industries. So all of you have to report to some governing body that, that needs to ensure your asset data, that where you purchased it, where it's at, who has it. You can answer all those questions and it can be hard to do. Um, and, and especially if you have to be concerned with the data that's on the devices, the software that's on the devices, being able to track that to um, uh, uh, these processes will really help you out. So as assets move through the disposal processes, like I said before, there are lots of manual updates that you need to do to maintain your compliance so that your asset accountability is documented and met throughout the process. So our solution, right? As assets are collected through various various HAM workflows, we're we're collecting them automatically, tagging them as um, in stock pending disposal. So we're ensuring that these assets are no longer viewable as available. That's very important, right? Because nothing worse than taking a, a laptop with a broken screen and forgetting about it on your desk for a week, and then when you finally put it back in the stock, you just throw it on the stack of the other laptops that look exactly the same, and the next technician can go in there and grab that laptop and redeploy it. And user flips it up and it's broken. You know, now you've wasted a bunch of people's time. And uh, so now we're, we're able to, to separate that. So these assets that are pending disposal will start to collect. Now you've got awareness. So now that I've got 100 assets on a pallet, I know that my disposal vendor will give me more money the sooner they get it. If that asset sits there for a year, it's going to lose value, right? I may They may resell it, right? I may be using a disposal or a disposal vendor that recycles or does donations, right? So the, the more efficiently we can get these out the door, the better. So we offer an end-to-end -end workflow, it's low code. Um, I'll be showing it to you in a second, like if you need to make updates, like if you have special, you know, I worked for a federal agency a few years back as an asset manager. For all of our disposal assets, if they were data bearing, we had to run a software to wipe the device. We had to put it through a drill press, literally drive a drill bit through the hard drive to make sure it was unusable. Then we put it in a little, it looked like an easy bake oven. It was a degausser that would, would run a magnet. We'd have to step back and uh, good thing I already have kids, right? Um, and it would demagnetize, it would run a magnet through it to, to wipe it. And then we had to run it through a shredder. A company would come out and they would film the hard drive going on the shredder train it would, and, and show and give us an eight second video of each hard drive being um, d wiped. So wow, yeah, but but being able to have all that accountability, we can add those those different tasks to our workflow very simply. Um, so whatever your process is, um, we built a very low code workflow on best practices that capture that, and I'll show you the disposal here in a moment, um, and show you how you can update it if you need to. But at the end of the day, you're going to end up with a request that's closed that has all the paperwork and all those artifacts attached to it that will also be related to all the assets that were disposed. So if you have a compliance audit comes up and they say, I need to see where these 10 assets are, you can say they were disposed on this date, this vendor picked it up and here's the paperwork, there's the receipts that show it was picked up. So everything is was right there. So any of your compliance requirements and your any ESG policy, policies your organization may have are all met. Okay, fantastic. And so, so on the next slide, you have these these just out of the box, these workflows that you've kind of been speaking to and, um, you know, anything else additional you want to add there on, on, on how, you know, simple it is for the customer here. Absolutely. Absolutely. So like I said, I mean, you know, one of the benefits of, of ham, right. Is, and what you're looking at, this is our flow designer here. So it's very intuitive. We used to have another, um, code heavy script, heavy, um, internal application that we would use to build these workflows. Flow designer, it's drag and drop. You're putting in pills, you're making your updates and doing all that. Out of the box, day one, you can turn any of these on and gain instant benefit in your environment with these end-to-end -end workflows. Um, whether you're doing um, you know, standard deployment, swaps, or retires from incident and change, they're already ready to go. Um, tech refresh, loaner, um, lease asset. That's a big gap of visibility, right? Is you know. I forgot my laptop today or my laptop broken. I need a laptop because I have a PowerPoint I need to deliver. 
a lot of times people are just like, here, take this asset. And there's not a process there to reclaim that asset. So now these leased assets, they don't get returned or they get returned when it's too late and they can be reused. So being able to manage that process is, is nice. Or being able to do reserve reservations. You may have an intern starting up in a month and you want to make sure they have an asset when they get there. So they're not just sitting there in their cube for three days waiting for equipment. Um, we have an RMA process. So now as all this defective equipment's coming back from incident and change, we have a process that helps you work with vendors to either get these assets repaired or replaced. Um, and then uh, we have, a, you know, we work with, we plug in very nicely with HR for onboarding. We have all these, you know, standard hardware workflows, but we also have an offboarding workflow. So as people are leaving the organization, we have one, one workflow that can collect not only the hardware that they have, but also the software, the SaaS subscriptions, uh, mobile devices, mobile device contracts, all those things that you don't think about when somebody leaves, we can make sure that there's a process that's that's trackable to get all that stuff back. Absolutely. That's fantastic. I think I still have some mouses from prior uh, jobs lay, lying around. So, you know, having those tracked is key. And they um, may not be, even might not be losing sleep over mice. One, the one thing that I've worked at companies where we, we reclaimed headsets and some of the in-ear headsets, the team would have to clean those out. <laughs> Sometimes I think the processes can get a little out of hand. Sometimes you have to look at what's the cost to manage it versus, uh, you know, versus that. So, totally. All right. So I believe you have a demo for us today. Sure, sure, sure. Um, so yeah. So I'm going to go ahead and, and and steal the screen share here. Bear with me here. Let me know when you can see my screen. Yep, we can see it. Gotcha. Okay, so what I wanted to do is I wanted to kind of show you guys something that, that's new that came in our last release is we're now offering what we call a guided setup. So this will walk you through the whole process of getting your, your, ham, your hardware asset management tool configured in your instance. So this covers all the different steps that are needed. Now, this instance has already been configured. It's a demo instance. But I can actually show you what that would look like to actually set up that workflow. And then I can kind of show you the workflow a little bit. And we'll, we'll talk about the, the disposal workflow here. Um, so as you can see here, that there's a, there's a step to set up all my different asset workflows. And these are all the ones that come with hand. So these are all those prescriptive low-code workflows. And, and, and some of these you know, can be applied to multiple assets. So our standard hardware requests, I could have three different laptops. I could have a desktop. We have a mobile device, and I just picked this flow and I published it to the catalog. But for today's discussion, we're going to talk about the disposal flow. So I can come in here and I can see the flow itself, um, and I can launch the the flow designer. Um, I can jump in and I can you know make any updates that need that need to be made. Um, I can look at different snapshots of of the flow here. So, and this is something normally you would have your sysadmin do, but you would build out requirements. So, like I said earlier. If you had a um, um, if you had a specific need for maybe data destruction or legal hold or something like that, this is where they would come in and update it. But it's all built as part of this guided setup. So for each of your workflows, if you did have to do customization, like I said, out of the box, they're ready to go. Some cases you may want to define assignment groups or things like that. And that's all done as part of any implementation for all of our workflows. But out of the box, they're ready to go on day one. But what I can do is I can also show you here from a workspace view what, what these look like. So as a daily asset manager, I can see here that there's already nine disposal orders that are created in this instance. Because you may be part of a global organization and you may be doing multiple disposals at one time. You may have disposals running and you know, one stock room here, one stock room there, and it can be hard to track all of them as they're in action. And I can see what stage they're in. So I could see this disposal order from San Diego is in the scheduling stage. Um, and, and so at this point, they've already selected and, and, and picked out what assets. Now I just have to go in and put in the details on, on when they're gonna be doing it. But I can see here, these are the seven assets that were selected there's a verification step at the beginning of this workflow. So it might be better actually if I, if I go in and I show you one that's in the draft stage because nothing has been done at this point. I've just started the disposal order. So you can see here at this stage, there's a task for me to go in and verify. 
And one of the cool things with, with HAM, with hardware asset management, and, and it gets confusing when I start talking about HAM and saying HAM, it's hardware asset management, is I can use my, my mobile device. I can use um, the ServiceNow agent app right on my phone, and I can go in and I can, at the loading bay, I can scan these assets. I can verify that these assets are, are planned, or I can go down with my laptop in a car and I can go in and and I can go in and actually verify and validate each one of these assets. I can go through and I can say, okay, yeah, these, that one's there, that one's there, um, and then click verify. This way, I'm, I'm I'm basically saying that yes, these assets are all pending disposal. These are all assets that we want to dispose, and I can go in and validate that they're on the, the pallet, they're ready to be picked up um, just by doing that. But I can also do it, you know, scanning with my mobile device. If you have, you know, zebra scanners that have the Android app and access to the play store you can also download the app on those as well and use those as an input device as well so once i went in and verified this um, now i can close this task out all my assets have now been verified and um, when i go back to the um to the the asset i have to do a refresh here this is normally doesn't happen this quick and now i have a new asset task to schedule the the workflow or schedule the pickup excuse me um, so when it loads up, now you can see there's a second task. You can see that the verify has been done. Now I have to schedule a pickup. So I call the vendor and I say, hey, when can you be there? Now I know, well, there's only seven assets. You don't need to send a, a flatbed. You can, you know, if you have a small truck or a van, heck, you could put this in the, the, the back of a hatchback, right? So I can go in there and I can say, okay, well, we can be there on Monday to pick those up. All right. I'm going to send Susan to get those. You know, and if there's if they give you a confirmation number, if they if there's like a, a number that they're given that they're working this ticket off of, and you may have pickup details, right? You know, come to the loading bay, and any additional info can go there. We actually have some of our, um, you know, there's integrations that you can do. A lot of our customers have built integrations with our disposal vendors, so all this data can be automated and updated. But as I've now that I've scheduled the pickup for this disposal. Now there's going to be a new task. So I'm going to come back here and we're going to refresh again. And you're going to see that there's now going to be a task for, you know, and this is where you can insert your data validation or your legal hold or any other tasks that, that would be required. Oh, I didn't close my, see, you have to just close the tasks. Oh, I didn't put in the scheduled day. I thought I picked Monday. So that's nice. So now it also, it's double checking for human errors as I'm doing this, which is nice because I am human. So now I can come back in here. Now there's gonna be the, the next task for asset departure. So this is that moment where as an asset manager, you've all been there standing on the loading bay, going through, making sure that they're picking up all the assets that they're supposed to pick up. And once again, with a mobile device, I can scan and confirm that these assets have been picked up. So I would come in here and I would select, I can select them all. I know there's just seven. And, and this is something that we'll see in Utah that we're introducing the concept of pallets. So that'll make making this stuff much easier. So now I can select that these seven are departed, but I could have also went in and opened up the, the, the ServiceNow app and scanned these as each one went on the loading bay. So now I've got this chain of custody that's building this disposal request. You can see all these assets that are now in transit. You, you saw, I only had to click a few buttons, right? So everything is now updated. They're all in transit and I can close out this task. As the truck drives off, I've done my due diligence. I've shown that all seven assets were picked up, whether I did it with my mobile device or I did it in the app or with a handheld scanner, all that's been done. And now I've, I'm rest assured that I can show accurately my asset data is correct, that these assets are updated. Now I'm just waiting to hear back from the vendor, right? The vendor is going to come back and say, okay, we've got these assets. You know, sometimes stuff will happen here where they'll say one of them is not, you know, we're going to have to just salvage it. It's going to go into scrap, but the other six that we can sell. Um, we have a workflow that's coming that if, if resale was done, there will be more updates to this where you can intake what they sold for. So you can actually show your total cost of ownership. You may have spent a thousand dollars on this laptop but maybe the disposal vendor resold it for 250. So that can help you down, down the road, show you what your actual cost of these units. But anyway, I digress. So now I can come here, I can close this task. The vendor confirmed it. They've, they, they've it's, you know, the disposal is done. Now there's one more task and that's the attached to certificate of disposal or any other documentation that's required. 
um, and we can go from there. If you're talking about the resale feature, that's going to be coming. Um, so donation and resale are going to be introduced in our Utah um, release. So there's a similar flow here. You may not want to dispose of these assets. You may want to donate these to a charity, but you still need to follow these same basic functions to do so because you need to be able to say that this asset was taken by a charity as opposed to a disposal vendor, but it's the same process either way. So very cool. But at the end of the day, you end up with a disposal request and with all the artifacts associated to it for all these assets. And you can see now all these assets, they're still in a pending disposal state because we haven't closed this out. They're not officially retired yet um, because we haven't attached that certificate of disposal. But as soon as we do, it'll update all the asset records and it's going to meet any auditor or compliance needs. So it's very, very cool. So that's it from the demo. Um, I did see there, there's a question that, that, that I apologize for missing the question. I wasn't looking in, I was looking in Q&A and not chat. Um, but it looks like somebody has questions around um, contracts. Give me a second here to kind of scroll through chat here. Um, so our content service doesn't look at contracts. Um, so that's a good question. So we do have a contract renewal workflow as part of HAM that was, that was introduced in our Tokyo release. And there is a stage in that when you're doing a renewal, where obviously you want to make sure you're only renewing maintenance, for example, on assets that are actually being used. So one of the steps of our contract renewal workflow, um, definitely if you want to learn more about it, I would talk to your account team. We can do a demo for you or there's lots of content around there, but it's called a contract renewal workflow. It comes with HAM. It also comes with software asset management as well, because you're also managing software contracts through SAM. Um, but you definitely, as these assets are updated, and that's all I mean, one of the payoffs of having a clean and accurate data repository of assets. If, if you know what's been retired, when you do these contract renewals, you know what you need to renew maintenance on or leases on. If you have the most up-to-date data, it makes life a lot easier. So, Okay, awesome. And, and we're off with questions. Uh, this is great. I have a question here from Matt in the chat or in Q&A. Um, that is, uh, as assets are deployed and the asset records updated, if there's a change of user that IT is not involved in or doesn't do via the tool, does HAM add any value in terms of seeing that different user via discovery, SCCM, or a third-party API? Would it update the asset record or does it flag the anomaly for you to investigate? So we would, we would want to flag it as an anomaly. We would never want to automatically update an asset based on who's using it because a desktop technician at the end of a week could have a thousand assets assigned to them because every time they sign into an asset, SCCM is going to show an update and it's going to write back to the CMDB that Joe Service Desk has been in that asset. So we wouldn't want to assign it to Joe Service Desk every time. This is where you can start reporting against, and, and, and there's tools that the system can use that, that can show that. Um, but to your point, what you want to avoid is, you know, if, if you know, one thing I always say is anytime an asset is deployed um, or updated or any of that stuff, there should always be a request or a workflow to do that. Now you're going to start seeing those anomalies. In the reporting, um, we have some, some information in our asset workspaces that'll start shining a light on some of these data anomalies. Because the asset updates happen automatically through requests, through incident, through change management, um, you'll know clearly when assets are being deployed. And one of the things that having this clean data set is, is you know, is, is when you see the data anomalies, they're gonna stick out like a sore thumb. And then you can start looking into who's making these updates, so on and so forth, and start looking at. Normally, you'll end up with a you know a couple you know people that will just be doing this stuff outside of the system, because um, once again, everyone's focus is on keeping the lights on, making sure business continuity is, is established. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Um, we wouldn't automate update uh, based on the CDB as a short answer there. All right, great. Couple more questions here in Q and A. Keep them coming. Um, Lillian wants to know when it takes three display names and normalizes it, does it change the display name for all three? Um, I yep. believe. Yep. Okay. 
So, so on the model record itself, there's a normalized manufacturer, normalized model name, normalized model number, part number. Um, it's not going to, the, the display name at the top, and that's a field that is a catenated field that's not editable. It's editable by updating these fields. So that that number, that name will, will change. Um, I hope that answers the question. Awesome. Question here from Tara, uh, that's pretty interesting. So we share a CMDB with other equipment that doesn't require location information. And we are trying to move to a model for fixed location assets, monitors, thin client, docking stations, et cetera. They run into issues with discovery, overriding location data, or when an associate is terminated, it gets cleared out. Do you recommend keeping all hardware in the same CMDB or are there ways to separate hardware types so we can better manage location information? Sure. So there's a there's a location field on the asset record. And then whatever you've done on the CMDB to automate that, that can continue on the CI record. But on the asset record, we have a location field that we update by process, not by discovery. Because um, we can't always rely on discovery, especially like if, if if I'm a remote user, but I travel to a lot of offices. So if I take my laptop to Texas for a meeting and discovery picks me up, I don't want that to change my location. My location should be associated to where that laptop's going to sit most of the time. Um, now, when we talk about devices like data center equipment, servers, network gear, and stuff like that, that should also be updated with process because at some point there was a deployment task that says, I need you to rack and stack the server in row six, rack 55, U28, right? So if you want to add those fields to the asset form, and we see that all the time, um, we see customers go in and put grids or, or expand their location hierarchy to show those specifics, or if it's in a network closet or wherever it sits, you want to capture that on the location field on the asset form. Because at some point, somebody asked for that asset to be put there. Um, and then we have a, a feature that's coming in the um, uh, coming up in a, in a future release around asset move um, that will uh, allow you to say, I want to move asset from point A to point B. And you have to put in the lo specific location information. And when that task gets closed, it gets updated to that location. So. So, yeah. So and we also I'm seeing a lot of questions in, in chat again as well. Um, I just want to make sure we've got like a couple more minutes here if we can hit a few of these. Um, yeah. One around the CSDM lifecycle, highly recommend. We have lots of documentation around CSDM. Yes, we have mappings to all of our current out of the box lifecycle states and substates that map into CSDM. Um, and so when you guys decide to take that CSDM journey, we support it for, for assets, for models or anything with a life cycle, um, we align with the CSDM. Definitely a, a big thing for us. Okay, great. We have a question in the Q&A asking around, um, you know, what, what are the best ways to, uh, do the service have a free review or are there other ways that a customer can, um, you know, do a review of their, of their, like, you know, real estate and see if there are ways to improve how they're using HAM? I love this question. So. There's, there's, a, there's a couple answers to this. So today we offer a health scan that you can talk to your account team where we come in and we run some scans and look at your you know configurations and how your environment has been configured and set up to give you an idea there. Um, if you're using, um, if you're on Tokyo, you can definitely go through the guided setup to make sure you've set everything up as, as it should be. There's a lot of um, configuration settings that get missed because it wasn't very clear, especially if you self-implemented. If you wanted one of our partners helped you implement, then they should have checked a lot of these boxes. But when we self-implement, sometimes we can miss things, right? So it's helpful to go through to make sure things have been configured. And then we just launched with SAM. Um, uh, it's called a SAM Success Portal. Highly recommend you check that out. It's got a value builder. It's got a few things. It allows you to really track your maturity. We understand that if you were to turn ham on when Paris came out and we've had six, five or six releases since then, you may not have jumped on every feature. You may not be using everything. So now as the journey, as your appetite for ITAM maturity expands, you can track goals. You can track this stuff and do that. We're bringing in um, a ham success portal as part of an upcoming release. So that's in our roadmap. So you'll be able to have that same maturity journey that, that you can track metrics against in the platform as well. 
Awesome. I love that we're getting, we're sneaking in different roadmap tools here and that is fantastic. Yep. A couple more questions. Edwin wants to know, will the asset move take into account? Okay. This is, this is from something we already discussed. Uh, will the asset move take into account the difference in location requirements? Uh, Michael, did that ring a bell? So any of our, any of our workflows that track to location, track to our common location table, it's common core data. We're just um, um, consumers of that data. We, asset managers don't manage that data. However, your organization manages your location hierarchy, you can scale our workflows to match that. So some locations track, when they track a location, they'll track the floor, they'll track to room. The, if you're using our WSD, our workplace service delivery product, it scales off the location table as well. So you can map to the locations as, as, as your organization sees fit. We see a lot of organizations just track to the address, um, but you know, once again, your address could be a 30 story office tower. And you know, a laptop is on one of those stories. So if you want to track the floor and room, if your location hierarchy provides that data and you've configured your tool to do that, um, our workflows are completely um, uh, in align with that they need to be. All right. One more question here, um, unless more come through, I think we have a little bit of time. Is the CSDM part of the platform, part of Ham Pro, or can it be leveraged even with ITSM's asset management? Our common service data model is a ServiceNow platform feature. It's for any part of ServiceNow, ITOM, Incident. It's everything where there's a life cycle. What we were finding as we were rapidly maturing through our initial releases up until I think Istanbul, it was either Istanbul or Kingston, um, somewhere around there, the, the concept for common service data model was said, hey, we should all be using the same taxonomy. So when we say something is in stock, it's in stock because in stock could have met something else in a different platform. So this is the whole point of the common service data model. Um, and it's still, even though it's been around, it's still kind of new. But it's really getting all of our different different product areas using the same terminology when it comes to lifecycle information. So to your to your question, yes, and yes, it's, it can be used anywhere. There's lifecycle information being tracked within the platform. All right. Well, we really appreciate all the positive feedback in the chat. Thank you, um, and I'm really excited to see some people getting started on their ham journey here. Oh, one more question coming through. Heather sure. wants to know. Okay, we're talking about row racks, cabinets. Yep. You're saying the service now has the ability to dr drill down to RU position, like grid rack RU? So, yes, you, you, you could configure it to do that. Absolutely. A common configuration we see is if an asset is in a data center, you would configure it to show a grid or a rack or a use space on the asset record. It's not out of the box functionality, but that's the beautiful thing with ServiceNow is it's highly configurable. Um, and I would also recommend checking out WSD. Um, there's a lot of expansion off of the, the location data model, but because we've built this, um, you know, we build ham. So at whatever level of location you're tracking, um, it's compatible to work with that. So if, if you're, and then one of the other things too, that comes with a, with a mature location hierarchy is a mature process to manage that location hierarchy as well. Cause you have to have somebody that goes in that makes all those updates as well. But absolutely you can add those fields to the form. You'll see in our Utah release, um, new fields added to the asset form for assets that are in a stock room. You're gonna see island space. Now we've introduced that from a platform feature. So any assets that are in a stock room, if it's, you know, cause some stock rooms are the size of my office here or maybe it's a drawer in somebody's cube. It could be a stock room and you're just, you know, tracking cell phones. But you could also have a stock room that's a warehouse that's the size of a football field. And knowing that an asset's in the stock room is helpful, but not knowing what aisle and what space on that aisle the asset's in. So that, that'll be out in the, it's somewhere at the beginning of Q2, end of Q1 in our Utah release. So stay tuned. Great question. Awesome. I really appreciate the interactivity, this makes it fun for me to, to do these when you guys ask all these great questions. I really appreciate it. And thank everybody for your time today. This was a great session. Great session. On that note, we'll wrap up questions. Um, so yeah, it sounds like a lot of people are at different stages of their journey. So because of that, you know, we, ha we have a number of white papers and user guides online. Um, Abby will be sending um, a handful of PDFs in the chat. We'll have those on the event page as well. Um, and of course, trainings, right? Now learning is robust. Um, we encourage you to, to join our hardware asset management fundamentals. Um, 
to, to get a deep dive and into the hardware asset management product. Um, and a number of other trainings exist on uh, uh, on the platform as well, little extras that you can kind of explore and take on that are relevant to you. The ITAM community page is an awesome place to start. Um, there is, of course, the getting started guide, um, but but also there's, a, like I said, a list of trainings, links to resources, and there's an opportunity for you to ask questions and communicate with other ITAM practitioners. We really encourage individuals to go there, explore, and, and, and you know, dive right in. You know, with that, we will be closing out this session for today. Keep an eye out for upcoming sessions in the future. Uh, thank you very much for taking the time to be with us and have a great uh, morning, evening, whatever it is. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you very much from ServiceNow.